According to the National Criminal Justice Association, the annual rate of firearm homicides in Chicago's deadliest zip code was 1,277 per 100,000 people. That same study found that the annual death rate for American troops participating in the Iraq War was 675 per 100,000 people, roughly half of the homicide rate in the Chicago neighborhood. Now, plenty of people have argued over whether or not it's fair to compare a neighborhood to an entire country. But fair or not, Chicago has gained a reputation for being a pretty dangerous city. Rappers like Chief Keef, Lil Dirk, Bump J, and the late King Von have made a living over rapping about what it was really like growing up in the hood in Chicago. Video journalists like Brandon Buckingham and Andrew Callahan have traveled to the notoriously dangerous apartment complex, O Block, in order to get first-hand accounts of the lives of people living around rampant violence and poverty. Spike Lee has a whole movie titled Shy Rack about gang activity in Chicago. That movie takes place predominantly in the neighborhood of Englewood, which coincidentally also contains O Block. It was in this infamous neighborhood, right at the height of the Iraq War, that a young basketball player named Derek Rose began making a name for himself for college scouts. Rose had a very difficult childhood, recounting in a documentary how he lived with 13 other people, some of whom were crackheads in a 5 bedroom house. But he found solace in basketball and his family quickly realized he was a prodigy. Despite his unfortunate circumstances, he managed to steer clear of both criminal activity and being taken advantage of by agents and focus all of his energy on perfecting his game. Rose would dominate high school basketball at Simeon Career Academy, winning two state championships and finishing with a 120-12 career record. He would go on to play for the University of Memphis for one season, leading them to a 33-1 regular season record and a March Madness second place finish. Rose was now not just a legendary college basketball prospect, but one of the most successful college rookies of all time, just as long as he didn't ask him about his SAT score. He was attracting plenty of buzz from the NBA, and was the consensus first overall pick for the 2008 draft. Unlike in the NFL, where the team with the worst record gets the first overall pick by default, the first overall pick in the NBA is decided by a lottery, in which every team that failed to make the playoffs has at least a 0.5% chance of being selected. So fans all across America eagerly awaited for May 20th, when it would be revealed which team won the Derrick Rose sweepstakes. The second pick goes to... The Miami Heat. And that means the number one pick in the 2008 NBA Draft will be made by the Chicago Bulls. With only a 1.7% chance at being selected, Rose's hometown team, the Chicago Bulls, had received the first overall pick. The local legend, the kid who made out of the hood and into the NBA, was coming back to play for his favorite team. What transpired over the next 8 seasons was some of the most riveting, yet heartbreaking basketball ever played. Rose would play through incredible highs, devastating losses, and life-altering obstacles. But, despite all of the hardship, would he find it in himself to pull it together and lead his team to a championship? I'm sure most of you already know the answer. But for those who do not, this is the story of Derrick Rose. Bitch, I'm the man. Give me my spot on that throne. They didn't want me to grow. They didn't know. I would make all of them go. I did it all on my own. Man, what was you? When I was trapped in my zone. Never had nothing to own. Just yeah, me. it's so hard to hide on my dog, nigga. I make a mistake and short. Where I shoot my shot at all these hoes, I fuck my shoulder up. Travis, what if they twins and they saw me, but they won't fuck with oh, me? Why would she want me? Fuck, I told you, to make it. This is Joe Kim Noah. He was chosen by the Chicago Bulls ninth overall one year before they selected Derrick Rose. And he might be just as important as Rose was to the Bulls. Except most people tend to neglect Noah and only focus on Rose. And I think the reason for this is that Joakim Noah is the polar opposite of Derrick Rose in every way imaginable. Rose was a point guard while Noah was a center. Rose was an offensive juggernaut while Noah was a defensive specialist. Rose was very respected by his peers and never got into any fights. While Noah had a bad reputation as a provocateur and was ejected four times throughout his career. However, the differences between the two players go deeper than their on-court play. So let's backtrack to when Noah was still growing up. Joakim Noah was born in 1985 to Cecilia Radhi and Yannick Noah. His mother was a beauty pageant model who won Miss Sweden in 1978 
and his father was formerly the third ranked tennis player globally and a huge celebrity in France. He would spend his childhood growing up in Paris and New York City, joining French basketball clubs and American private schools to chase his dream of becoming a professional basketball player. Despite his undeniable size and passion for the game, he faced some hardship during this time due to his behavior, having to repeat a grade and getting kicked out of a school for undisclosed reasons. However, he managed to pull himself together long enough to earn himself a scholarship to the University of Florida. Unlike Rose, Noah played three seasons in the NCAA. But also unlike Rose, Noah and the Florida Gators took home not just one, but two national championships. Noah was a key contributor in both runs, averaging 13.1 points, 7.8 rebounds, and 2.1 blocks over his two seasons as a starter. And he won the NCAA Tournament MVP for his efforts in 2006, thanks to his talent and proven capability to raise his game in high-pressure situations. The Chicago Bulls decided to draft him inside the top 10. However, even then, two of his college teammates, Al Horford and Corey Brewer, were chosen before him. Overall, Joakim Noah was a lot more privileged than Derrick Rose, and I think that is the big reason why so many people resonate more with Rose and Noah. Rose came from nothing and was never supposed to make it out of Englewood, let alone into the NBA. However, his God-given talent and his unrelenting persistence to succeed was undeniable, and he forced his way into not just the league, but the number one overall pick. Meanwhile, Joakim Noah had every advantage you could have growing up. Rich celebrity parents, a star-studded college supporting cast, and a height of 6 foot 11. The only obstacles he faced that were unique to him were his behavior issues, but those were entirely in his control. Noah was simply not as interesting of a player as Rose, so most tend to neglect him along with the vast majority of Rose's supporting cast when talking about Rose's Chicago Bulls. But I think that was doing them all a disservice, because as integral as Rose was to the Bulls, there were plenty of other good players on his teams that pulled their weight in trying to get Chicago their first ring since Michael Jordan. I think they deserve to have their stories told too. As much as this is a video about Derrick Rose, it is also about the Chicago Bulls and the players that made their mark on its legacy. So, let's backtrack one more time. This time to 1998. Harper got a piece of it! It comes off! The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship, and it's their second 3 -peat. In 1998, the Chicago Bulls took home their 6th NBA championship in 8 years. Despite their overwhelming dominance, nearly the entire team would tear apart over the offseason for reasons that could take up an hour-long video of its own. Coming into the 1999 season with a new head coach, and without their big three of Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and Dennis Rodman, no one really had high expectations for them, nor did the lackluster team subvert these expectations. They finished with the second worst record in the league, but distinguished themselves from whoever came in last by setting the record for least points scored in a game in the shot clock era. With their worst season of all time coming to a close, the Bulls' rebuild had officially begun. What followed over the next 10 years or so was a long period of failure and mediocrity. It took until 2005 for them to make the playoffs again, being led by second year player Kirk Heinrich. That season was also the first for rookies Ben Gordon and Luol Deng, both of whom would become key pieces for the Bulls over the next few years. Gordon was the third overall pick that year, and he established himself as a dependable bench player who could put up a lot of points. He ended up winning 6 man of the year that season. Deng, on the other hand, quickly entered a starting lineup, and he joined Ben Gordon on the all-rookie first team. Despite the team's success in the regular season, landing the fourth seed in the East, the inexperienced players would lose the first series to the Wizards, which they played without Deng as he was out with an injury. The next season was practically a repeat of the previous one, a decent regular season, but they didn't get very far in the playoffs. They were still in need of a true star player that the team could rally around. So in the offseason, they signed defensive superstar and former NBA champion Ben Wallace. Wallace and Kirk Heinrich would both make an all-defensive team the following season, while Gordon and Deng led the Bulls offensively, hosting new career best at points per game at 21.4 and 18.8 respectively. They were even able to beat the defending champion Miami Heat in a four-game sweep in the first round, earning the Bulls' first playoff win since 1998. 
They would lose to Walsh's former team, the Detroit Pistons, in the semifinals. But for the first time in a long time, the Bulls had a good thing going. Unfortunately, they would regress the following year and fail to make the playoffs. Ben Gordon failed to improve offensively and would go back to coming off the bench. Ben Wallace, who was never known for his offensive prowess, was now putting up a lousy 5 points a game. Their hot-headed rookie Joakim Noah was so off-putting that his teammates voted to suspend them for a game after he almost had a physical altercation with an assistant coach. Around the All-Star break, the team traded Wallace and some other players for Drew Gooden and Larry Hughes, but this move had little effect on the Bulls, and they finished with a 33-49 record. The team had already fired their head coach in December, and their interim head coach should be relieved of their duties after the season. But, as I said way back at the start, the Bulls' quote disturbing season was what gave them the opportunity to draft local legend Derrick Rose first overall in the next draft. To prepare for his rookie year, the Bulls re-signed Gordon and Deng to their roster. With Gordon going back to being a starter, the Bulls also promoted Joakim Noah and defensive specialist Tyrus Thomas to the starting lineup. Kirk Heinrich, the oldest tenured player on the team, would be tasked with coming off the bench and leading the reserves in order to make room for Derrick Rose. And to top it all off, they hired Phoenix Suns assistant general manager Vinny Del Negro to lead the retooled Bulls into a hopeful playoff appearance as their head coach. On October 28th, 2008, Rose and his teammates took to the floor for the first time in the Derrick Rose era. Away from behind, now Miller, the lead pass running in. As expected, the number one overall draft pick became a breakout star for the team. Rose was putting up 16.8 points and 3.9 rebounds a game, and also led his team in assists per game at 6.3. He managed to play 80 out of the 82 possible games that season, showing off his durability. Rose won Rookie of the Year almost unanimously, and it was clear that he had potential to be one of the faces of the entire league. The rest of the team, however, was a different story. They had their moments, but entering the All-Star break, they were at a 23-30 record, which was barely an improvement over the previous season. So, they ended up making a handful of trades, with the biggest one being their exchange with the Sacramento Kings. That trade gave them John Salmons, who would wind up as a starter upon Luol Deng experiencing a season-ending injury, and Brad Miller. Miller was originally acquired by the Bulls during the first few years following the 1998 breakup, but was traded to the Pacers before he could really develop. With the Pacers and then the Kings, he became a two-time All-Star. Ironically, by the time the Bulls got him back, he already peaked and was used as a reserve off of the bench but he was still a welcome addition to a struggling Bulls squad. The moves made at the trade deadline sparked something within the Bulls, and they went on an 18-11 run the rest of the season. They ended with a record of 41-41, and earned the 7th seed in the East. They would face off against the defending champion Boston Celtics. The Celtics were a tough team that featured the likes of All-Stars Ray Allen and Paul Pierce, along with a young Rajon Rondo. For this team to be the first playoff opponent of Rose Noah's careers was a trial by fire. The Bulls had a lot to prove, and needed to play as hard as they could if they wanted to upset the heavy favorites. He had injury problems there. He tore his the knee, his other knee up. Shot clock. Gordon on the side. Ball going to Tennant. What is he doing? Oh, he oh, just hit it! The inbound. There's Pierce. Rose defending for the top. Face. It's Pierce. Is this the dagger? Selvins. Switching inside. It is Pierce. Selvins on Allen. Screen by 
Pierce over him with the three for the tie. Oh, he's in it. Rose, Noah, and the rest of the Bulls pushed the Celtics to their limit in a seven game series. That broke the record for the most overtime games in a single postseason matchup. But ultimately, the Bulls had lost. Despite them failing, it was still the best first round exit they could have hoped for. And it was clear the team had potential to be great. Over the offseason, their general manager, John Paxson, was promoted to an executive position within the organization and gave the job opening to their director of player personnel, Gar Foreman. Foreman would remain with the Bulls until 2020 and would be integral in not only maintaining key pieces of their current roster and building around Rose, but also being a major part of the team's downfall. But that's something I'll get to around 40 minutes from now. His first priority was to re-sign Ben Gordon to the team, but that deal ultimately fell through and Gordon went to the Pistons. But what he did do was draft Todd Gibson. Gibson would remain with the franchise for the entire duration of the Rose Noah era. And while his only significant playing time as a starter was in his first season, he would prove to be a trustworthy player coming off the bench. He would earn an all-rookie first team honor for his debut efforts. Individually, the Bulls made small improvements over their last season, which might have been a consequence of losing their first offensive option in Ben Gordon. Kirk Heinrich rejoined the Bulls' starting squad and contributed with 10 points and 4.5 assists a game. Luol Deng was putting up 17 points and 7 rebounds a game in one of his best statistical seasons. Joakim Noah hit both double-digit scoring and rebound averages for the first time in his career. And to top it all off, Rose was now leading the team in scoring with 20 points a game, earning his first All-Star selection. But the team failed to improve on their previous season. They traded away Salmons and Tyrus Thomas for other rotational players to try and make another late season turnaround, but everyone they got failed to make a noticeable difference. They ended with the same exact record of 41 to 41. The Bulls would make the playoffs again, but only as the 8th seed, and they were beaten in 5 games by LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. After the relatively disappointing season, Foreman knew he needed to make bigger changes than what he scrounged together last offseason. Around a week after the Bulls were eliminated from the playoffs, Foreman fired Vinny Del Negro and hired Tom Thibodeau, one of the assistant coaches of the Boston Celtics who helped them win a championship a few seasons prior. Along with that, Foreman signed a ton of guys in free agency. Ronnie Brewer, Kurt Thomas, and future All-Star Kyle Korver joined the team to come off the bench and hold the team down while the stars were resting. He also signed Keith Bogans, a defense-oriented player who started all 82 games for the Bulls the following season. But, the most important player Foreman brought in was in a sign-and-trade deal with the Utah Jazz, which gave the Bulls two-time All-Star Carlos Boozer, who started every game he played in over the next four years. He would receive some flack from Bulls fans over time, who became fed up with his bad habit of taking long-range jumpers. But overall, he was still a welcome addition to the team. Boozer also punched a referee in the nuts one time. You see Booz with the spin move against Dirk. He wristed that in. Oh, oh wow! He did get it! So the Bulls did lose Kirk Heinrich in a trade with the Washington Wizards, but they had more than made up for this with all their new acquisitions. However, something else happened in the offseason that would have a huge effect on the Bulls and how they would be viewed narrative-wise. That offseason, Former first overall pick and reigning two-time NBA MVP LeBron James was going to become a free agent. He had played for the Cleveland Cavaliers since he was 18 years old, as he was drafted straight out of his high school in Akron, Ohio. At first glance, it might seem like LeBron was going to re-sign with the Cavs. He lived in Ohio all his life, so why turn his back on them now? The answer was that LeBron had plenty of incentives to leave. LeBron was undeniably talented. But all of the efforts his front office made to help him failed spectacularly, and referring to them as efforts might be giving them too much credit. As an example, in his final playoff series of the season, LeBron led his team in rebounds, assists, and steals, 
was second on his team in blocks, and scored almost twice as many points as any other player on the Cavaliers. And he was still accused of quitting on his team by media analysts. For comparison, while Rose was the clear leader in scoring and assists for the Bulls, Luol Deng was contributing almost as many points himself, and Joakim Noah was grabbing 13 boards a game and playing outstanding defense. Rose arguably already had more help in his first two seasons than LeBron did during his entire NBA career up until that point. Combine LeBron's lack of support with a rumor going around regarding LeBron's mother and one of his former teammates, and LeBron became very open about his intent to explore offers from a variety of teams in the NBA. One of these teams was actually the Chicago Bulls, who were ecstatic at the thought of pairing their hometown hero Derrick Rose with their division rivals. However, he ultimately passed on them and signed with the Miami Heat, along with fellow All-Stars Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. But instead of this decision being revealed in the newspaper or something, LeBron turned this moment into a whole spectacle. He filmed a 75 minute long TV special for ESPN to build hype for his decision. And then he threw a huge party in Miami before he even played a game for them. While the special was also used as a charity event that raised millions of dollars, many NBA fans were still pissed at LeBron. He had left his hometown to join a super team on the opposite end of the country because he didn't think his hometown was good enough for him. And he made his leave as publicized and dramatic as possible. He was rubbing it in in the faces of all of his fans in Cleveland who supported him from high school all the way to the NBA Finals. He was no longer LeBron James. Now, he was Le Trader. To this day, Le Trader's legacy has never fully recovered, and he is still criticized for taking the easy way out in his early career. Le Trader was no longer the hero of the league. He was the villain, and the NBA needed a new hero. For all niggas, y'all niggas, that's that shit I don't like. Yo shit, make believe, rapping about my own life. Woo! That's rare, nigga. Woo! Rick Flair, nigga. Woo! The power's in my head, nigga. Woo! I get this beat the chair, nigga. Soho, a Tribeca, three hoes, trifecta, dope money, hope money, shoe blow, my watch better, my pen's better, you don't write. Trendsetter, you clone like, pay homage or case vomit, ungrateful niggas I don't like. To say D. Rose had a career year would be an understatement. Within this one season, he made his case for why he was the best player in the entire league. D. Rose put up new career highs of 25 points, 7.7 .7 assists, 4.1 rebounds, and 1 steal a game. He was in the top 10 for both points and assists, and also played every single game except one. He even scored his first and only career triple-double. In terms of advanced stats, he was 9th in player efficiency rating, 5th in win shares, and 3rd in box plus minus and value over replacement. His explosiveness on the court was undeniable to fans of all NBA teams, and a little terrifying to players across the league. All of his efforts were not just empty stats on a mid-team either. Under Rose's leadership, he led the Bulls to a record of 62-20, and 20, earning the number one seed in the East over LaVillain's Miami Heat. Rose was an all-star starter, a first-team All-NBA, and most importantly, was voted league MVP at the age of 22, setting the NBA record for youngest MVP of all time. Rose had lived up to his generational hype. None of this is to imply the rest of the Bulls were bums. Joakim Noah continued to improve defensively, and was named to the all-defensive second team for the first time in his career. Luol Deng started every single game for the Bulls while averaging 17.4 points a game, while Carlos Boozer matched that average point total while also catching 9.6 rebounds a game. Even the Bulls' faculty and staff were being awarded, as head coach Tom Thibodeau was named Coach of the Year, and GM Gar Foreman was jointly awarded Executive of the Year with the Miami Heat's Pat Riley. With all the success in the regular season, the only thing left for the Bulls to do was to make a run at a title. But before I move on to the Bulls' postseason run, I want to discuss Rose's MVP in more detail. Derrick Rose's MVP season is viewed as an outlier, with the main reasoning being something that will start to be apparent later. But looking at the stats for this year, there's another thing that jumps out. Trader James was statistically better in nearly all aspects than Rose. He scored more points, 
logged more rebounds, played better defense, and was miles more efficient than Rose was. As said before, LeBum won the previous two MVPs, and spoiler alert, he would go on to win the next two after Rose. In hindsight, it seems pretty weird that, in a 5 year span, LaFraud won MVP every year except in the middle of his legendary run, when Rose won it despite having worse numbers across the board. This is a discrepancy that, while in the present most people might understand, in the future will probably become a lot less clear. The reason Rose almost unanimously beat out the spineless was, at least a little bit, because the NBA was sick of the crook and still mad over the decision. When you dramatically leave your hometown, no matter how valid your reasoning is, obviously people will be less inclined to vote for you for what is essentially an award for the league's favorite player that season. Especially if the alternative is voting for a kid who was playing for his hometown team and finding major success. It also helped that Rose earned the number one seed over the Miami Heat and the Scaredy Cat. However, Rose's success becomes even more incredible when you look beyond the social climate of the NBA at this time and at the team he played on. Rose, on paper, was on a much worse team than not just the backstabber, but many other star players. The Celtics literally had four players make the All-Star game this season, and they were only the third seed. I've said repeatedly how my goal with this video was to shine a light on all the players who contributed to the Bulls during this era. And that is true. But as much as I praise them, players like Lou Aldeng and Carlos Boozer are not perennial all-stars like Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. Defensively, the team was a juggernaut as they had the single best defensive rating in the league. But in basketball, good offense beats good defense. And when it came down to it, the only truly great offensive player on the Bulls was Derrick Rose. When the league was beginning to enter an era where superstar players switch teams every few years to chase championships, it was incredible that the number one seed in the East was defense oriented and led by a single all NBA level player who came from the city he played in. So why not deem that player as the most valuable? But as much as Rose was praised during the regular season, he and the Bulls still had a lot to prove in the playoffs. Nobody would care about how good they were if they couldn't back it up when it mattered most. The Bulls would first face off against a Pacers team that lost more games than they won. If the Bulls somehow lost here, it would be genuinely embarrassing. So despite the lackluster competition, they still had to play their hardest. And that's what the Bulls did. D. Rose made a statement in Game 1, dropping 39 points on the Pacers along with 3 blocks. Luol Deng contributed with a double-double, and Noah held it down defensively. While the team was trailing by 8 with 3 minutes left, the combined efforts of Rose, Noah, and Kyle Korver were enough to pull off the comeback and seal Game 1. The next two games were similarly close, but ultimately, Rose and his team pulled ahead to lead the series 3-0. They stumbled a bit in Game 4, with Joakim Noah somehow leapfrogging Rose, Deng, and Boozer to become the team's best offensive player for a night. But they responded with a devastating Game 5. They won by 27 points, with 6 players contributing at least 10, and Noah throwing in 4 blocks as well. Now, they were on to Atlanta to face the Hawks, which were led by Noah's old college teammate, Al Horford. The Bulls would lose Game 1 in a close matchup that the Hawks pulled away with in the 4th quarter. In response, the Bulls won Games 2 and 3 pretty decisively, with Rose setting a new career high in points in Game 3. The Hawks responded by winning Game 4 to tie the series up, but again, the Bulls won Games 5 and 6, holding the Hawks to just 83 and then 73 points. Rose averaged nearly 30 points and 10 assists throughout the series. And all around, the Bulls were playing incredible defense. But now, it was time for the matchup everyone was waiting for. The league's newly found heroes, the Chicago Bulls, versus the biggest villain in the NBA, the Snake James and the Miami Heat. The Bulls came out swinging in Game 1, holding both the Brick and Dwayne Wade to under 20 points each in a game they won by 21. But this must have awakened something in the heat, because the Bulls would drop the next 3 games by at least 10 points. Rose's already shaky efficiency fell dramatically, as he struggled to shoot 40% from the field, while the heat improved offensively with each game, figuring out how to beat the Bulls' suffocating defense. This all led to a climatic Game 5, where the Bulls continued to struggle offensively. Deng shot a disappointing 35%. Rose shot a bad 31%, and Carlos Boozer shot an ass 17%. Despite this, the Bulls led most of the game, with them being up by 12 with 3 minutes left. 
but that's where Lee Clutch and Wade stepped in. 65 Chicago, Wade on the run, banks it home from the NBA Finals. Rose trying to get a little too tricky there. Here comes Wade. He scores and a foul. Still very much alive as we come up on two minutes to play in the fourth. James for three. Yes. Brewer remains defending on James. Wade on a step back for three. And he was fouled by Rose. And got picked off James for three, and the game is tied at 79. Now it was all tied up with a minute remaining. The Bulls had their season on the line, but they were at home and had the reigning MVP on their side. Surely they could find a way to extend their season just a little bit longer. Timeout, Miami has a foul to give. That pass broken up by James. So Rose trying to throw to his right is picked off. Shot clock at five. LeBron with the step back, yes! Five second differential, here is Rose, and he draws the foul this time. Uh, deflect the, the ball like he just did. Just For the tie. And now Bogan's going for the steal on Bosch and commits the foul. Yeah. At the line, 81% during the season. Miami turned it with a 16-3 run. So Corver. Now they got to look for a three. They trap Corver. Down to three. Down to two. Here's Rose. Can he get it off? It is blocked. That will do it. Well, in a story, the Bulls would have probably beaten the evil Atreider and his team of crooks. Real life is much different than fiction. The Rose and the Chicago Bulls fell short in making the finals and was ultimately a pretty bad loss. Rose took a lot of the blame as he shot an effective field goal percentage of 0.379 and had 19 total turnovers. But Joakim Noah might have actually been worse, as his effective field goal percentage was 0.317, a drastic decrease from his regular season average of 0.525. But at the end of the day, this was the first serious playoff run of both of their young careers. They would have plenty of opportunities to improve their game and compete yet again in a postseason run. And so, the Bulls would run it back again in the next season, because of how much success the Bulls just had, their offseason was pretty quiet. They drafted a small forward from Marquette named Jimmy Butler, who would barely play in his first season, and traded for the draft rights for EuroLeague legend Nikola Mirotic. But they wouldn't officially add him to the team until 2014. The only noteworthy free agent they signed was Rip Hamilton, a former three-time All-Star and NBA champion of the Detroit Pistons. He was past his prime at this point, and only played less than half the season for them due to injury, but he was still a welcome addition when he was on the court. They would go into the 2011-2012 season with the third best odds to win the championship, and in the regular season, they lived up to the hype. They technically improved on their previous record, winning 50 games and suffering only 16 losses in a lockout shortened season, and they again finished as the one seed in the East. D. Rose did not quite have the MVP level season as he did the year before, and only played about two thirds of the season due to recurring injury troubles, but he was still good enough to be an all-star. Additionally, for the first time in his career, Luol Deng was named an all-star, and he also received all defensive second team honors. In general, this team was great defensively, as they were first in opponent points per game and second in defensive rating. So, as expected, the Bulls were off to another postseason with the goal of finally taking home a ring. Their first matchup was against the 76ers, who had only won 35 games and were led by all-star Andre Iguodala. This series was going to be a walk in the park for the Bulls, who at this point were probably thinking about a rematch with the Heat. Game 1 went pretty well for the Bulls during the first 58 minutes. After the start of the second quarter, they took a lead that they maintained the rest of the game. Joakim Noah scored 13 rebounds, Deng and Hamilton efficiently put up 17 and 19 points respectively, and D. Rose almost had his first playoff triple-double, with a stat line of 23 points, 9 rebounds, and 9 assists. But it was in the last 2 minutes of the game, when the Bulls were up by 12, that tragedy would strike. After this one play, everything would change for the Chicago Bulls. 
And our knockout punch that, look, we're, we're looking to sweep you guys. You wanted us, you were crying out that you bypassed the, the harder team in Miami. Oh, 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 Roach came down bad on his left foot. See him holding onto his knee, holding onto his knee and down. He was flying and he came down wrong on the left foot. Now, whether it was an ankle or a knee, I do not know. There's Coach uh, Collins out there and all those teammates running. And this, with the injury, we just talked oh, about the 26 games he has missed. Within a short minute. Both fans and players did not know what to think when Rose went down. Joakim Noah later stated in an interview that he didn't think much of Rose's injury when it happened and was focused on finishing out the game. But. It was actually the worst case scenario. Derrick Rose tore his ACL and he would miss the rest of the playoffs. All of a sudden, the Bulls were down their best player and the momentum of the series shifted. One guy, one injury, changing everything. The Bulls would lose the following three games and to make matters worse, Joakim Noah would suffer an ankle injury during game three and in his season as well. At this point, any remaining hope the Bulls had disintegrated. The Bulls would lose a series in six games, becoming just the fifth number one seed in NBA history to lose in the first round. Head coach Tom Thibodeau was already being blamed for the disappointing season, literally as soon as the broadcast showed Rose getting injured. And I'm sure everyone around the country oh, is gonna say, wow. why was he in the, in the game? It was his decision to keep Rose and the other starters in the game for so long, resulting in Rose getting injured when the game was practically over. And yeah, everyone who says that does have a point. But the Bulls could not fire Tom Thibodeau over this one ridiculously stupid mistake. At least not yet. He literally won Coach of the Year one year prior for his work with D. Rose and the team's defense. For now, the Bulls had to find a way to make do without Rose as he recovered. This loss was absolutely devastating for the Bulls, and really all of Chicago. Ignoring the fact that they were massively upset in the playoffs, the city had come to see Derrick Rose as a hero. He was just an ordinary kid in a bad part of town, but now he was one of the NBA's biggest talents. This was around the time the Chicago Joe music scene really took off, and Rose was frequently name dropped by rappers like Chief Keef and Kanye West. Life, shout out to Derrick Rose. He was becoming larger than life, and viewed as an inspiration for and an icon of Chicago. To see him lose not because of his own failure, but because of an injury that was out of his control, was heartbreaking. However, the weird thing about this injury was that Rose was never marked as out for the next season. Every few months, there would be an update on Rose and his injury, with him showing signs of trying to return onto the court. All the while, there was a distinct lack of D. Rose on the Chicago Bulls. In March of 2013, about 11 months after his injury, a doctor apparently cleared Rose to return to the court, but he still did not return. Then, a month later, another source claimed that Rose was completely healthy, but he still was not playing in any games, which only added a fan's growing outrage. Ultimately, Rose was never ruled out for the season despite never appearing in a single game. This media circus was very frustrating among Bulls fans, who were dying for D. Rose to return to the court. But in hindsight, we can assume that the Bulls probably knew they were going to be without Rose for an entire season, so they needed to make some moves if they wanted to remain contenders without him. The Bulls traded away Kyle Korver to the Hawks in the offseason, but a week later, they signed a familiar face, Kirk Heinrich, away from them. This created a new star in five of Heinrich, Hamilton, Noah, Deng, and Boozer. This lineup was, all things considered, alright. And they also brought in slam dunk contest legend Nate Robinson to back up the age in Heinrich. Deng, now being the Bulls' leading scorer at just 16 points a game, made his second All-Star game in a row. And Joakim Noah made his first All-Star game too. Noah in general had a career year, setting career highs in all five statistical categories and making the all-defensive first team. The only real hiccup was that, at this point in his career, Hamilton was clearly showing his age, having one of his worst statistical seasons and facing stretchers of inactivity. But, while Hamilton's value to the team declined, another player was rising up the ranks. Let me
click, yeah. Jack man sat the bush, yeah. Don't see go surf, yeah. We cold dick shot a zerg, yeah. A gang of bitch bought purse, yeah. I did it off for one verse. I'm sipping syrup inside the verb, yeah. I'm leaving my mark on the earth, taking my drugs at dust. I briefly mentioned Jimmy Butler being drafted by the Bulls in the previous season, but I never addressed him again because he was literally the Bulls' least valuable player in his rookie year. He was second to last in points per game in the regular season, only in front of Brian Scalabrin, and was dead last in playoff points with zero. But as it turns out, Butler is used to being underestimated. Jimmy Butler was born in Houston, Texas, where he lived with his mother until he was a teenager. Upon turning 13, his mom straight up kicked him out of their house, rendering him homeless. Butler spent a long time crashing with the families of various friends, before finally settling in with the family of Jordan Leslie, a future NFL player who was just a freshman in high school at the time. Butler clearly had a talent for basketball, but due to his unfortunate circumstances growing up, he was not recruited coming out of high school. He instead enrolled at the nearby Tyler Junior College and joined their basketball team. With his junior college, Butler finally began to draw interest from D1 schools, who were looking to give scholarships to players whose talent went unnoticed in high school. He eventually accepted a deal with Marquette, who he would play for in his sophomore, junior, and senior seasons. It was with Marquette where Butler took another leap, going from a person lucky enough to get an athletic scholarship after attending community college, to a highly regarded NBA prospect. His strong work ethic and yearly expansion of his game is what convinced the Bulls to select him with the last pick in the first round, even if they did not really have any short-term usage for him. In a very confusing and almost irrelevant season for the Bulls, Butler had his chance to prove himself to the organization that he was worth keeping around, and prove himself he did. He played in every single game that season, and was officially promoted to the starting roster to replace Hamilton by the time the playoffs rolled around. Like most players on the Bulls, he was a talented defender, and while he didn't make an all-defensive team, he did rank in the top 20 for the Defensive Player of the Year award. Not bad for what was essentially a rookie player. Even crazier was that he wasn't even a slouch offensively. In the games he started, he averaged 14.5 points, which would have been good enough for third on the entire team. Even if Deng, Noah, and Butler all stepping up, the Bulls were not great offensively. In fact, they may not have even been half decent offensively. They ranked 29th in points per game, but with all the talent they had on defense, the team was still a force to be reckoned with. Their biggest regular season win came near the end of the year against the Super Team, as they ended the Miami Heat's 27 game win streak 101 to 97. They finished with a 45 to 37 record, good enough for the fifth seed in the East. Now it was time to run it back and see if they could pull off a playoff run without their star player. The Bulls lost game 1 of the series to the Brooklyn Nets in a blowout. They recovered the next game with a 90-82 win. Game 3 was super low scoring, even for the Bulls' lousy offense. And despite not scoring any field goals in the last 5 minutes of play, the Bulls' great defense won them the game. But game 4 was easily the highlight of the series. This was a nail-biter that went into triple overtime, with Kirk Heinrich almost logging 60 full minutes of play. Despite rupturing his calf in the second quarter, the Bulls were actually down 15 points with 3 minutes left in the fourth quarter, but Nate Robinson came in clutch, scoring 13 unanswered points, and assisting Carlos Boozer's shot to send the game into the first overtime. Ultimately, the Bulls were able to outlast the Nets and go up 3-1. Unfortunately, this game was where the Bulls' season peaked. Kirk Heinrich was now out for the rest of the playoffs, and while Nate Robinson proved in the previous game that he was a capable starter, then Lou Deng went down with an injury after Game 5. The Nets managed to win back-to-back -back games to force a loser goes home Game 7, but the Imploden Bulls team pulled themselves together long enough to win Game 7, and actually advance in the playoffs without Rose, Heinrich, or Deng. The Bulls would face the Lucky's Miami Heat in the semifinals, where their injuries and complete lack of offense finally caught up to them, losing the series in 5. Despite the loss, this was all around a decent year for the Bulls. As frustrating as Rose's injury was for the fans, Noah, Deng, Butler, and the rest proved they could hold their own, at least defensively. Now, they just needed to make some adjustments to prepare for D-Rose rejoining the team. In the offseason, 
they lost Ned Robinson to the Denver Nuggets, but they brought in Mike Dunleavy Jr. to be a consistent starter for the next few years. They also drafted the main man, the top dog, Quintuple Zeros, Kawhi Leonard Stunt Double, and the Cardio King, Tony Snell. The Bulls ended a 2013-2014 season with the third best odds to win the championship, but they got off to a shaky start with a record of 6-5 after 11 games. Disappointingly, D. Rose was far from his explosive MVP self. In his return game, he only scored 12 points on 26% shooting, while Butler dropped 20 and Boozer dropped 30. His averages over his first 10 games were not great either, only scoring 16 points and 4 assists on 35% shooting. He was also averaging the same amount of turnovers despite taking less shots each game. But it was a little understandable that Rose would need to take some time to adjust back to the NBA. Unfortunately for him, 10 games is all Rose would play. Derrick Rose suffered another major injury, this time a torn meniscus. Unlike the previous season when the exact timeline for his return was never revealed, this time Rose was officially ruled out for the entire season within a few days. The fans would have to wait even longer to say healthy Derrick Rose compete for a ring. To make matters worse, Luol Deng had suffered a rift with the Bulls front office, who offered Deng a $30 million 3 year extension of the team only to be denied. Almost 30 games into the season, when the Bulls were playing pretty poorly, the Bulls traded Deng to the Cavaliers for Andrew Bynum and some draft picks. At that moment, it seemed like the Bulls season was over. Their top two offensive players were now injured and traded, and while Jimmy Butler was improving, he was not quite ready to carry team on his back into the finals. At this point, their record was a lousy 14-18. Someone needed to step up if the Bulls wanted any chance of even making the playoffs this season. I'm about to spot me a high, I'm about to spin that trunk. My man got me a switch, we can get stuck by luck. To say Joakim Noah had a career year would be about as redundant as saying Derrick Rose's MVP season was a career year. Noah was easily outperforming every season he ever had. On paper, his 12.6 points and 11.3 rebounds a game don't seem that impressive when compared to players like Shaq, Embiid, or, like, Andre Drummond. But, it was Noah's defense that reached a whole new level. Noah led the entire league in defensive box plus minus and defensive win shares. Despite his mediocre offense, his defense also carried him to top 10 win shares and value over replacement as well. At the end of the season, Noah was not only once again named to the all-defensive first team, but he easily won Defensive Player of the Year. However, that was not the only thing Noah excelled at. I said before that Noah was still not that impressive as an offensive player, and that was still more or less true. But with Rosendeng gone, Noah added a new layer to his game, his newfound passing ability. Noah was now averaging 5.4 assists a game, when in previous seasons he was only averaging about 2. That might not sound like a lot, because in today's NBA, centers like Jokic and Sabonis come close to averaging 10 a night. So, let's put this number in context. Noah was ranked 25th in assists among the whole league. Among the 24 players above him, every single player was a guard except for two, Lee's selfless James and Kevin Durant. And Durant only beat Noah out by 0.1. Even crazier is that the sensor of the second highest assist per game is Marc Gasol, who only averaged 3.6, almost two full assists less than Noah. Noah was a one-of-a-kind player in the NBA for this season, and his contributions did not go unnoticed on his team. After their poor start, the team rallied around Noah to go 36-16 and 16 the rest of the way, finishing as the 4 seed. Jimmy Butler was named to the all-defensive second team, and not only did Noah receive those defensive awards I already mentioned, 
but he was voted to the All-NBA first team and finished fourth in MVP voting. For comparison, the player who currently has the fourth best odds of winning MVP this season as of Reading is Luka Doncic. So it's safe to say the league thought highly of Noah. It did not matter that the Bulls' leading scorer was a bench player named DJ Augustine, who I haven't even mentioned up until now, and only played on the Bulls for this season. With Noah leading their outstanding defense, it seemed like the sky was the limit in what they could accomplish in the postseason. Good defense here by Washington. They continue to recover. Heinrich shot deflected short. The Bulls did take the lead at one point. Led by his man is 13, but the Wizards percent. He's been in foul trouble for the second half. Picked up four in the third quarter after that. Great team play. Beautiful chemistry. Dangerous pass. Wall. Watched by Heinrich. One on the shot clock. Here's Wall. Yes! Oh. Only the third playoff series that Washington has won in 35 years beat the Bulls. Unfortunately, John Wall's Washington Wizards were a little too much for the Bulls to handle. It turns out that having the worst ranked offense in the league actually does matter more than I just made it seem. The only player who averaged over 15 points in this playoff series was Todd Gibson, but that's a little misleading since he had one game where he dropped 32. Without it, he would have averaged 14.8. The Bulls could get by in the regular season with the best defense, but they needed more help on offense if they wanted to finally get over the hump. Luckily for them, D. Rose was about to make his second grand return. Many fans could not wait for Rose to come back to the Bulls and bring life into their offense. But at the same time, not everyone was as optimistic. There were major questions about whether Rose would be athletic enough after all his injuries to go back to his all-star level form, let alone a potential MVP. Additionally, many fans straight up mocked Rose on social media for his injury problems. While today it's easy for NBA fans to look back at this and wonder why people treated the now universally beloved Rose so poorly, think about it this way. Ben Simmons has been the NBA's biggest target of ridicule for years, in part because, while his career started out strong, he now faces a lot of injury issues that frequently keep him off the court. He has only played 57 games over the past 3 years, and even when he does play, his numbers are a lot worse than when he was at his peak. In that same time span following his MVP season, Rose played 48 games, with his numbers in those few games also falling short of his peak. People were already viewing Rose as a guy who could have been great, not a guy who was great, and this season would be crucial to change Rose's new image in the league for the better. To prepare for Rose's return, the Bulls re-signed Kirk Heinrich in case something went south for the third straight season, signed Aaron Brooks for some more offensive help, and finally made the call to Nikola Myrotic to join the NBA after holding on to his draft rights for three years. But. The biggest move they made by far was releasing Carlos Boozer, who was no longer worth his big contract, and replacing him with two-time NBA champion Pau Gasol. Even though Gasol was entering his 16th year in the NBA, he still brought a much-needed offensive spike to the team. With all these changes, the Bulls rolled into the 2014-2015 season with a starting lineup of Rose, Butler, Dunleavy, Gasol, and Noah and a supporting cast of Heinrich, Snow, Gibson, Brooks, and Myrotic. They were given the fourth best odds to win the championship, and fans all across the league could not wait to see if Rose and Noah could finally lead their team into a title. Chicago Bulls fans technically got what they wished for as the Bulls were off to a great start, even being ranked number one overall in December. While they fell a little bit in the power rankings, by the All-Star break, they were at a 34-20 record. With their last win being against the Cleveland Cavaliers, who the Guild had signed with over the offseason, but their success was not because of Rose and Noah leading the efforts. Rose had improved a little bit from his shortened previous season, but it was clear the doubters' fears were correct, and his athleticism had dwindled over time. Rose's decreased strength exposed the fact that he was not a very accurate shooter. And in a league that was in the midst of the three-point revolution, having your alleged MVP caliber point guard shoot 28% from the arc was pretty bad. He also still suffered from lingering injuries late in the season, missing 20 out of their last 25 regular season games with another meniscus tear. Although this time, he came back for the playoffs. While Noah was not as criticized as Rose was during this time, his numbers also took a sharp decrease from his almost MVP season, only averaging 7 points a game. 
Even though the Bulls old stars were fading, they were still winning games thanks to the leadership of Butler and Gasol. Jimmy Butler again improved his game massively. He led his team in scoring with 20 points a game while not giving up many turnovers, was nabbing 1.8 steals a game, and also shot with good efficiency relative to his teammates. For his efforts, he was not only named an all-star and given a spot on the all-defensive second team, but he also received the most improved player award. But Butler may not have even been the best player on the team, as Gasol was having a career year too. At age 34, Gasol was scoring 18 points a game, which was more than D-Rose, and led the team in rebounds and blocks over Noah. Gasol was not only named an All-Star, but also made the All-NBA second team. Even if fans are unhappy with Rose and Noah's efforts this season, they still had a pretty good team. They could seriously make a deep run if Rose and Noah went back to their All-Star level play. The Bulls finished with the third seed in the East, and faced off against a baby Giannis Antetokounmpo in the first round. The Bulls upped their game in this series. Butler averaged almost 25 points and 2.5 steals a game. Gasol and Noah held Giannis on their 13 points in 5 of their 6 games. And D. Rose improved his scoring and assists. The team won the series in 6, winning the final game 120-66. Which meant it was off to Cleveland for the Bulls to once again face off against Lee Regret. The Bulls were able to pull away with a win in Game 1 at Cleveland. With Rose, Gasol, and Butler all dropping at least 20 points, the Cavs would strike back in the next game to tie the series 1-1. to -1. This led to a big game 3, where Rose dropped 30 points, La Butterfingers turned the ball over 7 times, and Cleveland's Kyrie Irving only shot 3 of 13 from the field. Despite the Bulls' strong performance, the game came down to the wire. With 11 seconds left, Cavalier J.R. Smith sank a 3-pointer to tie the game. The Bulls called a timeout with only 3 seconds left, and they needed a miracle if they wanted to stop the game from going into overtime. Put it on the floor and make a play if no one else is available. Dunleavy. Looking. Finds Rose. Rose trying to get open. Fires away. Beautiful Rose was officially back. This was probably the best moment for the Bulls all season. A semi-final playoff game against a division rival at home, and the hometown hero Derrick Rose sinks a buzzer beater from three. Bulls fans were over the moon, because it finally seemed like they were gonna beat the choke. But this is when the Bulls annual postseason meltdown began to take shape. Cal Gasol already left game three early with a hamstring injury, and was ruled out for games four and five. While Gasol's scoring had taken a small hit since the postseason began, he was still one of the Bulls' best players and his absence would be missed. Then came Game 4. This was a close game just like the previous one, but unlike Game 3, Bulls fans were not going to like the ending. With 8 seconds left, Derrick Rose tied the game with a layup, and the Cavaliers head coach immediately called a timeout. This should have been a penalty, because the Cavaliers had no timeouts left, but this obvious call goes unnoticed. Not just by the refs, but by the players too, who keep on playing. Just a few moments later, Lee Refball takes the game into his own hands. James for the win! It's gone! LeBron James at the buzzer! Stuns the Chicago Bulls and the series is tied at two games apiece! This loss was highly demotivating to the Bulls. They had just come off of one of the greatest playoff games they had ever seen in the post-Jordan era, just for the crook to one-up them on a play that should have never even happened. In Game 5, the Bulls lost 101-106, to with Rose shooting 29% and making 0 of 4 three-pointers. The next and final game the Bulls played that season was a stinker of a home game where it seemed like everyone except Jimmy Butler was checked out after leaving the first half down by 14. Even if the Cavs almost went on a 6 minute run without scoring any points, Noah only scored 4, Gasol only scored 8, and Kirk Heinrich almost put up a Tony Snell stat line of 0 points, 0 rebounds, 0 assists, 0 steals, and 1 block in 20 minutes of play. The real Tony Snell, who only played 5 minutes, was the team's leader in box plus minus this game, which perfectly sums up their disappointing end to the season. After the loss, 
Head coach Tom Thibodeau was fired from the Bulls organization. Thibodeau was crucial in a lot of aspects of the Bulls' identity during this time. It was him who led the Bulls into becoming one of the best defenses of this era, and he also was very successful in the regular season. But, offensively, he was unable to help the Bulls reach their full potential, and it was clear that D. Rose's injury issues, which Thibodeau's coaching philosophy unintentionally led to, had ballooned into a major issue. So, Thibodeau was out. To replace him, they brought in Fred Hoiberg, who was previously the head coach at Iowa State. The front office believed that their current talent was adequate enough to still win a championship, so they barely messed with the roster over the offseason. The only big move they made was re-signing Jimmy Butler on a huge extension. What the team did do, however, was bench Joakim Noah for Nikola Myrodic. Given Noah's success the past few seasons, this was somewhat of a surprise even if Noah had a down year. Mike Dunleavy would be out for the first half of the season as well, so Todd Gibson and Tony Snell were given extended minutes. Despite these switch-ups, the Bulls were still given the second best odds in the Eastern Conference to win the championship, and were expected to win around 50 games. And at first, it looked like another great season for the Bulls, who got off to a 15-8 start. But, slowly, the season began to slip away. After their great start, the team would go 15-15 and 15 in their next 30 games. And when they lost Jimmy Butler to a short-term injury for most of February, they went 4-8 and eight for that month. Butler and Gasol were named All-Stars again, but Gasol was only added as a replacement for the injured Butler. Joakim Noah only played 27 games off of the bench, before receiving season-ending shoulder surgery, and D. Rose, despite playing in the most games since his MVP season, yet again failed to return to his All-NBA level form. The Bulls did not make a late-season rally, and would barely miss out on the playoffs despite posting a winning record of 42-40. and 40. Despite how hard everyone on the team had worked in the past few seasons, Biden injuries and the media's expectations, and despite how much hope the fanbase had to see D-Rose play one more season as physical peak, the Chicago Bulls championship window with Derrick Rose and Joakim Noah was over. The Bulls were no longer contenders in the East, and needed to rebuild. Derrick Rose had done a lot for the city, and still wanted to remain in Chicago, but it just was not working. And since Rose was set to become a free agent following the next season, the Bulls management decided to get something out of him while they could. On June 22nd, 2016, Derrick Rose was traded to the New York Knicks for Robin Lopez, Jerry and Grant, and Jose Calderon. In public, all parties remained cordial with each other, and Rose even stated how he thought he would be forming a super team with the Knicks' best players. Carmelo Anthony and Kristaps Porzingis, but in reality, the truth was much different. During the exact moment Rose was traded, he was filming a documentary about his life. His live reaction to being told he was traded was caught on camera, and it was clearly a very distressing moment for Rose. He had gone from being a kid growing up in a bad city around crackheads, crime, and poverty, and into a beacon of hope for that same city. But now, it was time for him to go. Fortunately for Rose, he would not be alone in moving to New York. The Knicks decide to offer Joakim Noah a four-year, $72 million contract, despite Noah recovering from a major shoulder injury. The Bulls then lost Pau Gasol in free agency, and traded Tony Snell to the Bucks for Michael Carter-Williams. They had already traded Kirk Heinrich during the previous year's trade deadline, and fast forward in a few months into the season and Todd Gibson was traded as well. It's okay though, because they still had Jimmy Butler, and the Bulls' management were going to bring in more young talent to build around their last human all-star. What was the front office's big plan to retool their roster? Bring in a 35-year-old Dwayne Wade, and a 30-year-old Rajon Rondo who came off the bench for a third of his games. This season was actually not as big of a disaster as you might think. The Bulls mostly hovered around 500 for the whole season. Jimmy Butler was still an all-star, and for the first time in his career, he made an All-NBA team. They even snuck into the playoffs as the 8th seed, but lost in the first round to the Celtics. Ironically, despite all of the renovations they made, the Bulls' main problem had not really changed. Good defense, bad offense. Switching out Rose, Noah, and Gasol for Wade, Rondo, and Lopez did not hide this fact. 
The Bulls really needed to blow it all up and start from scratch. The Bulls traded Nikola Mirodic to the Pelicans once the season was over, and also waived Rondo and Wade due to their lack of meaningful change they brought to the Bulls offense. Finally, to officially mark the start of the rebuild, the Bulls traded three-time All-Star Jimmy Butler to the Timberwolves in exchange for Zach Levine and the draft rights for Laurie Markkinen. Fred Hoiberg, who was ranked the worst coach in the league by March of 2017, was actually kept by the Bulls for an extra year and a half. But while he may have been listed as a head coach, everyone knew that his real job was to be the Chicago Bulls tank general. They failed to win a championship with D Rose. They failed to win a championship with Jimmy Butler. And after nine years, it was time to reset. The legacy of Derrick Rose and his Chicago Bulls teams will forever be a complicated one. Rose only had three great seasons before injury set in, and the Bulls never even made a finals appearance. In a lot of ways, the Bulls were underachievers during this era, a team that on paper had the right talent, but could never seem to make it work. If the Bulls managed to stay healthy, or if better chemistry was developed between Rose and Butler, then maybe they could have actually won a ring and be remembered as more than just a decent team playing in the GOATS era. But we do not have to imagine a world where Rose and his Bulls are remembered fondly, because even if they never won a championship, the joy they gave to fans all around Chicago is something that they will never forget. The Bulls before Rose and Noah joined were an afterthought in the league. They had found success in the 90s with Michael Jordan. Then he left, and the team became a bunch of nobodies and has-beens. The Bulls suffered a decade of mediocrity, all while parts of the city they played in deteriorated around them. Like I said back in the beginning, Chicago was nicknamed Chirac for a reason. For a lot of people living in Chicago, their lives straight up sucked, and they could barely find solace in their washed up basketball team. Then, here comes this basketball prodigy from the streets of Englewood. Rose could have very easily fallen into the same traps dozens of kids across Chicago fall in, but he and his family avoided all of them, and proved to Chicago that it was possible for a kid like him to escape poverty and become highly successful. But not only did he make it into the NBA, he even played for his hometown team for 8 years, and became their star player. Even after Rose left the Bulls, he still carried the memories of Chicago on his jersey. With the New York Knicks, Rose changed his jersey number to 25 in honor of Ben Wilson who was a high school basketball player that went to Rose's high school in Chicago. Wilson was, at one point, ranked the number one college basketball prospect in America, but before he could commit to university, Wilson was shot and killed after taunting another high schooler. Rose choosing to wear Wilson's number is his way of honoring the legacy of his city and the players that came before him. And now, as more generations of players enter the league, we get to watch the players that Rose and his teammates inspired. In 2010, during the height of Derrick Rose's peak with the Chicago Bulls, there was another kid from Englewood who was watching Rose play in his city, and was now making waves of his own. His name was Anthony Davis. As Derrick Rose dominated the NBA and won MVP in the United Center, around 10 miles away, Anthony Davis went from a regular teenager playing for a high school that did not even have a gymnasium, to the number one college prospect in the nation. Davis would spend a season playing for Kentucky, get drafted first overall by the New Orleans Pelicans, make three All-NBA teams during his tenure there, and then go to the Los Angeles Lakers where he would win a championship with Lil Mickey, doing what Derrick Rose never could. But, Rose was not the only bull to inspire future stars in the NBA. Right before Joakim Noah's legendary Defensive Player of the Year season, when he had already established himself as one of the league's best defenders, a 7'1 big from France was drafted by the Nuggets and then immediately traded to the Utah Jazz. This player was Rudy Gobert, and he would go on to win three Defensive Player of the Year awards, and is projected to receive another one this year. Noah and Gobert are not a one-to-one -one copy of each other's game, but considering the circumstances, it would not be surprising in the slightest if Noah was a big influence on Gobert. Of course, there is also that other great defensive sensei from France who is gaining traction in the league. Back to Victor, another three! Get out of here! Oh my goodness! <laughs> 28 for Victor Wembenyama. Holmgren, trying to answer. He is stuffed and taken away! Likewise, 
After bouncing around the league for a few years, Jimmy Butler is currently playing for the Miami Heat, a team that has used a very different strategy for success ever since the trader betrayed them and defected back to Cleveland. The Miami Heat are now afraid to take chances on undrafted players who spent a long time in college and this has led to highly valuable pickups of players like Duncan Robinson and Max Drews, the latter of whom came out of DePaul University in Chicago. It's possible that this change in strategy is a result of the front office observing players like Butler, players who don't automatically go to a top D1 college right after high school, and have to work their way up from a junior or D3 college. As much as I thought about ending this video with yet another paragraph about how much this team meant to the city of Chicago, the truth is that you already know that by now. Honestly, any basketball player that makes it into the NBA immediately becomes a symbol of hope for wherever they came from. It's just that Derrick Rose is the most obvious example of this phenomenon since he played for where he grew up. What makes his team truly special is that you can already see the effects these guys had on the league. There are dozens of current NBA players right now who grew up watching Derrick Rose, Joakim Noah, and Jimmy Butler and model parts of their games after them. They may not have the same level of accolades as other legends from this era, but that did not make watching them any less entertaining or impactful. To the kids watching at home, it did not really matter if you were a kid growing up in an apartment in Old Block, or living in a luxury villa in France, or sleeping on someone's spare couch in the South. Everyone could find someone to root for on the Chicago Bulls. Thank you for watching. <laughs>
for some old shit, they wanted they payback. So we escaped it all in the booth with the playback. Cause this the only place that we knew you were safe at. Yeah, uh, corner start to the parts for my no day. Yeah, a no day. Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll get lost in the world like we want it. Hey, you know me. Can't afford shit with your chips hey, The choices hey, uh. Over the floor And he's taking this on as a challenge And goes right at Derrick Rose And everybody here at United <laughs> Center Chanting MVP, MVP chance. First free throw for Derrick I think that was a smile too